Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge & Company. Richard Emery's been called a super lawyer by his peers, but to me, he's the guy who challenged the city government and won. His speed and anger in defense of our civil rights and the right to have honest government is one of our indispensable weapons. And that's why I'm anxious to hear what he thinks about last week's ruling on the campaign finance by the Supreme Court. Welcome. Thanks, Ronnie. Nice so what to do you here. think? Well, it's a very, um, it's a very deeply troubling case. Uh, it's really, actually, sadly, a testament to the absence of uh, Justice O'Connor, uh, who I think, if, had she been on the court, would have never allowed this case to, mm. uh, to come out the way it did. Uh, it's a very grave statement about our value system by these five justices that corporations, that accumulations of wealth, cannot be controlled by legislatures who see that this undue influence on our society is taking over an election process. And, and in fact, the, the, the process by which they were trying to, the legislature was trying to control uh, the corporate exercise of political activity was very modest. It was a very minor mm. control. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, this five judge majority just swept it away in the most broad fashion, basically saying that corporations have the same right to speak as you and me, notwithstanding how much money they have, how powerful they are, how much influence they have, and how intimidating they am, are to politicians, especially in Washington, as we yeah. know it. Can I, you don't mind if I interrupt no, you every please. once in a while? No, please. When they say that a corporation has the same right as a person to speak, you don't take into consideration the amount of money that's needed to do that speaking? Well, they're saying that money is the equivalent of speech in the electioneering process. And what that, if you then equate the right to speak uh, and then say that money is the essence of speech in this context, you're giving the corporations a huge leg up if you can't, if the legislature, if, if the, the laws can't control them and keep them in uncheck. They get undue influence uh, over the whole system. And you, I mean, you must know this as a, as a uh, former public servant and, and an elected official, how intimidating it is, how, how money is the lifeblood of politics. And you know, in New York, we're lucky because we have a campaign finance system. And the ultimate answer to this problem Which is, is good. Which is safe. It'll be safe. Oh, that's safe. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Th this, ca this case of, did not affect in any way the, uh, the contribution limits and the contribution controls to candidates directly. What this case said was is that corporations have the right to independently finance their points of view, even on behalf of a candidate, saying to the public, either don't vote for this candidate or vote for this candidate for reasons which we're going to describe to you, often with hit ads and nasty distortions of the truth. And those independent expenditures on behalf of, cor of candidates by corporations, which happen to serve their interests. I mean, you can imagine mm -hmm. how the oil companies are just r going like this with their hands, thinking about how much they can do to open up, open up the national parks, open up Alaska, with intimidating politicians who are going to make these decisions on a national level. This is very has very serious consequences. Um, it's interesting because it's also interesting because even before this, corporations had a huge amount of power through mm -hmm. PACs and through influence of candidate um, points of view out of the window period. This only affects the 60 days prior to an election. And what was the corporation that brought the suit? Is it kind of a phony corporation? Well, it was Citizens United. It was a nonprofit. Yeah, that's. It yeah, was. It's it, not comparable, is right. it? Right now, it, it's important to recognize that obviously. Corporations are allowed to speak. I mean, after all, the New York Times is a corporation. What it does is speak. So there are clearly speech, uh, there is entitlement to speech among corporations. The question is, at what point the government and the people's interest is so great in the distortions that the corporations can inflict upon the electoral system that they have to be controlled? Media companies can endorse people. That's fine because they're media companies. But can oil companies then go do hit ads on, on uh, politicians and candidates who are for ecological, uh, inter who want to speak out for ecological interests? That's very dangerous. And we don't know whether foreign corporations are uh, 
include it or not, do we? Well, if they have American subsidiaries, which most foreign corporations so do, they will So we can have Chavez from Venezuela. Right. M maybe that'll be the, the absurdity of all this. <laughs> right. I mean, uh, yeah, go but, ahead. But if they cite a First Amendment, at the time, when was the First Amendment? What was the date? Well, it's, it was in the early 1791, right. I believe, was when the Bill of Rights was passed. So do you think when that was written, anyone had in mind television, you know, airways, uh, the corporate structures the way we have, it's, how does that get accounted well, for in the law? It's interesting, in the, in, the, in the opinions, in the debate between Stevens and Kennedy and, and also Scalia's concurrence yeah. against, uh, there's this debate about what people thought when the First Amendment was, was uh, passed. It's clear that nobody thought about it very much for all the reasons you're saying. They didn't understand the technology. Not only that, they didn't even, corporations weren't right. yeah. what they are today at all. Right. They were in fact, sort of monopolistic franchises that were granted by the states, uh, uh, by various governmental entities over particular subject matters. There were only 300 plus corporations at the time in the early 1790s. Uh, so it's a it was a completely different kettle of fish and, and the framers certainly never thought about corporations, but they did think about undue influence and aggregations of power and they were extremely interested in controlling that. And, and, and not letting, and, and of course, foreign influences. Yeah. And so Stevens marshals this evidence very effectively to say that it's peculiarly and appropriately within the traditions of the United States to have legislatures control these kind of aggregations of power and not let them totally distort the normal democratic process of voting among people. It's fascinating, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And it's so hypocritical also, isn't it, in this recent debate about judicial appointments, that the liberals are going to make laws right. <laughs> and the conservatives. <laughs> right. There's a whole discussion in the opinions about, uh, you, as, as you know, what you, your point is really that there were two important opinions that were overruled by this opinion, opinions which upheld the right of the government to control these sorts of expenditures, these independent expendit expenditures by corporations. And they were thrown out. They were just swept aside with no respect for the holdings that, that mm -hmm. one of them was 20 years old. So yes, it is remarkable how sweeping and how aggressive the five justices are, are who, who engage in this, you know, um, particularly Justice Roberts, who in his, in his uh, confirmation hearings was talking about the power of star decisis and being an umpire only, when if it's plain that he has an agenda for corporations, I mean, he worked his entire career for corporations, for corporations. That, that elevate them far above any other power center uh, in his view in the system. Do you, it, um the airwaves, I mean, this is something that has always bothered me. The mm -hmm. airwaves are, are publicly owned, right? Mm -hmm. People are, organizations are licensed to operate on those airwaves. Why do we allow what goes on, you know, the domino th effect of them? I mean, I just don't understand that. A, a television station gets a license to operate on a... On a Bandwidth or whatever. Yeah, yeah whatever. And then it can, it then sells the time. So this is not, well, it's the first question we, we were talking about, whether the freedom is just restrictive to the speech or whether you have the freedom to buy it. I mean, why, why aren't we ever able to legislate that the airwaves would be free for political reasons? Well, it, it, because you're telling private companies how they have to use their speech. Now, that, it's not, but obviously you can do that in certain right. si situations. But compelled speech is one of the most serious incursions in the First Amendment that we can think of. What do you mean of. by compelled? Well, when you force somebody to say something or finance words that they don't want, that they don't agree with. And what's interesting about this case, along the lines of what you're saying, is that corporations have stockholders. Many of those stockholders don't want to say what the corporations are saying. And they are, in so many words, being compelled mm. to make these political statements with which they don't agree. Now, you could say they can sell their stock and leave, but it's not as simple as that. It seems to me that one of the solutions here, and one of the solutions that Chuck Schumer is now exploring and others are, mm -hmm. are exploring, is creating new forms of corporate democracy where people who don't agree can start 
actions against their own company if they're speaking in ways that are not consistent with the stockholders' beliefs. There could be a, a requirement that that a majority of shareholders agree with any message or endorse yeah. any message. There could be a number of ways that stockholders could control the corporate speech. I mean, this isn't as good as what we had before this opinion, but it may provide some kind of control. Also, you know, it's also important not to too, too, uh, not to lose perspective on this, because corporations don't like to spend money on speech unless they have to. Right. So it may be that they don't want to offend their stockholders, they don't want to offend their customers, and a lot of them won't do it. But at the same time, just the threat of their lobbyists in Washington, going to a senator, going to a congressperson who has to get elected every two years and raise money for, and saying, we're going to run ads against you. Imagine how intimidating that is because the congressman's going to know they have the means to do it, even, right. if, even if it's just a threat. Right. So, and, and the political timing of it with all the, the, the questions about the tea parties and uh, all those, that, those extreme groups who are really threatening the usual political practices mm -hmm. um, actually makes it seem more important. It does make it, it seem more important. It certainly gives them more power locally, don't you think, on local elections? Absolutely, yeah. it, it gives them power across the board. And, and of course, the midterm elections, which are coming right. up in November, seem to be a very sensitive period. It may be, the, the, the predictions are that the Democrats are gonna lose a lot of the, the majority that they have. We'll see if that's true or not. But certainly, it, it, it instills paranoia in a lot of candidates. And a lot of candidates are gonna be currying favor with corporate interests in order to avoid right. the problem that might arise. Right. And it also with, with the economy the way it is and, and all this populist sentiment that they label. With, with all the different spectrums or, or the different abilities, I mean, if you have one station, it also brings along, cha uh, you know, it owns some of the uh, cable channels and all of that. Couldn't the FCC, if it was really an activist group, restrict <laughs> the purchase of television time on certain places, make it a local? I wonder if they the, could do that. There, there are things that the FCC could do, but in, in this environment, Ronnie, I think that it and wouldn't have much effect because of the internet, because of cable on demand, because of cable, because of uh, uh, shows on demand. Right. There's so much new media that is unregulated and even unregulatable. And it would be a bad thing, as we know. I mean, Hillary Clinton's new initiative is to have a free internet. Yeah. I mean, not to allow China to censor in any way. That makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, it makes sense that the internet be as free and open as possible, as uncommercialized, it's gonna be commercialized, but as uncommercialized as possible. And that instinct leads against government control of any of the airwaves. But, you know, in yeah. the traditional sense, the FCC does, used to have fairness yeah, rules. It does. I, it's interesting to me. I keep wondering. I think that we're overstating most likely the impact of the ruling. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, as you said, I think that it's not going to be a freewheeling thing that everybody's going to go out oh, and no. take it. Oh no, no. In fact, it doesn't. It doesn't but, inhibit controls of campaign contributions. The old style of saying that you can only contribute X amount to a candidate stays in effect because that's the, that has been upheld as the appearance of corruption, basically paying a politician off for uh, mm. a, a result, a quid pro quo, or at least the appearance of a quid pro quo. That regime stays in effect. This is only about corporate expenditures for independent electioneering, independent of the candidate, right. even though it may favor the candidate or may intimidate the candidate. But I, I do think that while it is being exaggerated in one sense, the effects of it are very severe in another, and that's what I was talking about, the intimidation right. uh, factor. And also the, the fact that the court did this. Well, I yeah. think that's the most it's shocking very depressing. thing. Isn't it, that shocking? It's very depressing, they yeah. didn't have to. They didn't have to be as broad as they were. Right. They certainly showed their predisposition to supporting the corporations, and it, it was really a shocking statement well, of what we see in the future. And, and it's even more shocking in the following sense. Everything you're saying is absolutely correct. Um, it's even more shocking in the, in the sense that 
these five justices are usually thought of as pro-government justices. Yeah. But n this wasn't a pro-government case. The government came out on the side of the dissenters, came out for regulation yeah. of the speech and this exactly. regulation of corporation. This was a departure to kind of a very, very neoconservative, not neoconservative, a real cons classic conservative exactly. point of view that is government stays out of the political realm entirely even when the, the forces are distorting the per political realm and even when the government's role is to preserve a fair fight. The problem here is that the court now is saying the government can't even keep a fair fight in terms of the electoral mm. process. And that's frightening to me. It's frightening that if they're distorting the First Amendment, so because the First Amendment is supposed to be what preserves democracy, right. what allows people to make decisions about how they're going to vote because they get all the information. And here they're letting it be used as a distortion of the free flow of information. Now, you're not only interested in what happens in the Supreme Court, but you're interested in the integrity of government right? Yes. And we talked about corruption. Um, do, you, do you do cases or do you uh, participate in other states or is it basically a New York state on the commission? Uh, well, uh, we've it's been in New York. Public in, what is it called? The, the commission? commission of Public Integrity. integrity. And, and, um, and, we, uh, and it also the Judicial Commission mm -hmm. I wanted to, to, mm -hmm. to uh, discipline judges who don't act fairly. And, and both of these entities are an attempt to preserve for the public uh, public officials uh, in, in operating in ethical ways. The Public Integrity Commission is is uh, uh, invested with very limited laws because we're not even allowed to look at the legislature. You just make we, the decisions on the rules they give you. I mean, that's I'm, right. Yeah. And and we do something with lobbyists on the lobbying side, and we do do the, the executive officials and the government officials of the state and local localities, but the legislature itself is essentially unpoliced. They have a nominal le legislative ethics commission which does nothing. And yet, because our scandals in this, in this uh, state seem to be centered on the legislature lately, we seem to get the blame because nobody understands we don't have jurisdiction over the legislature. So can you think in your great imaginative mind um, how we could bring a class action suit against the legislature? Well, it can't be done because of the separation <laughs> of powers, and it would be, it Not would be. Not you, a, but I meant citizens. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think, yeah, I, I mean, the citizens have I mean, to use the democratic processes, and the key thing here, it seems to me, is for um, there to be participation in government for I people to you. really vote. It's our fault. Yeah, no, Absolutely. it's our fault. It's you can't. Fault. You can always point in the other direction, but it really, in the end, it's the fact that nobody mobilizes and votes these people out, right. and nobody votes. I mean, they have three thousand, five thousand people vote them in. Right. Right. That's what the sadness of this thing is. Well, you know, the, the system is to some extent designed for incumbency, right. to protect incumbency. The, the whole redistricting process, which we've fought, which we've done a lot Do of litigation Do we know what's going to happen with that? This, we don't know yet. Yeah. We don't know yet. And Who's working on that? It's just the leaders of the legislature so and far, the governor? So far. So far. Right. Um, but, but more importantly, I mean, the notion that we have a, an election on a work day is crazy. Every other country in the world has it on a Saturday or a Sunday or a day that's not a work day. I mean, people would participate at a much higher level. The notion that we have to barriers to registration, registration. Is, is crazy. I mean, we're really intentionally, for the sake of mm -hmm. incumbents who pass these laws, mm -hmm. discouraging participation at every level. And that's shocking, and that's distorting, too. It's not a First Amendment distortion, but it's an inhibition on the right to vote, which is a First Amendment problem. And, and all kinds of abuses that go on constantly, as you as you I mean, it's yeah. just, do you think that a, a person should have the right to go on forever in the legislature? I think term limits are the wrong answer. I don't think, I think when you do a great job for me as my representative on the Upper West Side, uh, I want you to stay as long as you're still functioning well and you shouldn't be term limited out. You're a presumptively qualified candidate. Why should my right to vote be circumscribed by disqualifying you? The answer is participation. Now, it seems that things are so extreme and we've lost all sense of participation that term limits look very appealing as a simple fix to get everybody, to get everybody out and just say throw the bums out. But it's really wrong for my liberty as a voter mm -hmm. to be blocked by term limits. I can't vote for you when you want to run and I want to vote for you. It's such a shame because New York has the campaign finance so it can't be just money that's keeping other people from coming to run. 
But if you didn't have term limits, you'd have people there for 20 some odd years and everything else. Seems to me if you stay in an office like that for more than 20 years, you've been worn down by the system and you're not going to be as effective. I mean, I. Right, but that, ultimately so, that's about people knowing who they're voting right. for and, re and, why, and being yeah. involved. And that comes but back again to the, voting. The New York it's, City. I mean, yeah. yeah, the New York City campaign finance system is really a model. It's, yeah. it's really quite terrific. It's very generous. It's very generous. Five and six to one, depending mm -hmm. on the circumstances. That a small contribution nets a very large amount of money to spend. Mm -hmm. And when you think about it, campaign finance reform is the answer to all of, to much of these problems. It's not the answer to all of the problems, but it's the answer to much of the problems. And statewide, it would be very important, and nationally, it would be even more important. And the, the problem is that people talk about spending the money. If there's anything that's worth spending the money on, it's finding good people to, who are then given the means to run right. for election because they will figure out ways to save the money in the long run. Right. It's such a small amount of money for such a big bang for your buck that it's, it's really short-sighted for people to be against it. And the only people who are really against it and effective are the incumbents That's, who right. want to stay in office. It's, I, you know, I'm thinking that it's also become a hand, you, you hand it down to your kids or your, to your sister or your brother or your cousins because yeah. nobody's paying attention. But then you think, I mean, the Adams, there was a couple of Adams that ran. Did we always have this family kind of thing, do you think, in history? I don't. I think there is a, 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 um, a, a kind of hand yeah. me down there. Look, it's, it's all a function of, um, it's all a function of the age of, of kings, right? I mean, we, 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 there should probably be a presumption against people who are, who are family members to leaders, but it's just the opposite. There's somehow this visceral reaction that these people are gen uh, genetically more qualified than others. Uh, but you know, th there's a lot of upheaval in the system too. I mean, th the notion that a Democrat couldn't win in Massachusetts is astounding. E even as bad a candidate as Coakley was. Um, but you know, I notion. think there have only been four women, including Coakley, uh, elected statewide. I, I read that. Isn't I read that. That, that is remarkable. It yeah. is remarkable. But so we haven't cleared all the barriers all around yeah. either. No, of course yeah. not. And and I, I was very surprised that she didn't do didn't win, and that Brown could come from nowhere. But it just shows. It really does show that in times of turbulence, which we seem to be in the middle of, people can emerge. Not necessarily the ones that I want or you want, but people can distinguish themselves, right. and if they have high aspirations, they can go out there and get the attention. And they, they have need. a little style and a little. He right. had a lot of energy and style with his truck and everything else, right. and he was very appealing. I guess right. that's a very bad. It is. It shows, but it's in a way, it's what makes politics exciting when you have right. those kind of charismatic candidates. Well, I mean, our president is one of them. Yeah. I mean, he he was oh. he took the country by storm. Unbelievable. Yeah. And, and I think it's a, a great event. I wish that his uh, governance was as good as ca his campaign. Yeah, but I don't, I mean, I think he's getting knocked around. Of course he unfairly, is. Unfairly. Oh, I do too. Terribly unfairly. I do too, but he, he still needs to show a, a kind of determination and leadership. Right. He doesn't seem to understand, my view, that power requires the use of power. Yeah. In order to be perceived as strong and to be a leader, you have to, to use move. your power. This business of accommodating all interests and trying you to be post-partisan in this environment is, it seems to me, totally naive. This is the most partisan time I can remember. Oh, me too. Do you think it was as bad when FDR was first there and he tried to pack the court? No, I don't think yeah. it was even close. Yeah. I don't think the kind of personal and attacks, and also there just wasn't as much information. People weren't bombarded with all kinds of false and distorted views. I mean, And that's know. the other thing. Let's go back to television. Could yeah. we ban political talk on cable? <laughs> Here you've got, you know, people, even on my side, I, I can't listen to them anymore. Right. Um, it's too much. And because they have to fill the time, it goes into all kinds of crazy things that they're talking about. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, a sad truth that the, that the First Amendment, yeah. uh, as good and as important it is, I mean, it is the American religion, after all. Yeah. We believe, strangely, that if we have more information, our government is going to be better. Now, there's a logic to that. But nobody's proven that there are better governments that come out of more information. I think it's probably correct. 
Yeah. But it's an intuitive notion, and yeah. that intuitive notion is, seems to be our religion. The, the, the logical outgrowth of that is Glenn Beck and all the crazies that are on Fox and, and all the nonsense that we hear from every it's direction incredible. and the blogging and the, and the <laughs> unlimited amounts of information that people seize on and actually believe right. that is pure nonsense. Right. I keep thinking in this whole thing with corporations, um, f with that threat that corporations are going to take out, are going to advertise and unfairly, of um, during the, um, the communist fear era mm -hmm. when we had blacklisting and when some corporations wouldn't allow the television stations to have people who were on the list yes. on their shows. And then the boycotts that went against the products that did it. Was, it's that, you think that we'll find a reason. I think we will, don't you, Equilibri uh, equilibrium? Well, I mean, um, corporations have enormous power in our society. The last thing they need is more. Um, and this last week, they got a lot more. What they did in the 50s, um, obviously, was cooperate with a, a terribly mm. intimidating period when there was a kind of um, uh, 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 a kind of uh, doctrinaire view of what people in power had to be, namely they couldn't express themselves. They had to be, yeah. they couldn't say anything that was humanistic, let alone sh socialistic. Yeah, right. yeah. So uh, we lost a lot of freedom during that period, but I think we learned from that. I think the, the process now is, is kind of bedlam. It's like anything goes and the problem with that is that when they have all the money and they can influence and intimidate people to, to vote in ways that provide them with the economic structure that they need to uh, be rapacious, if you will, um, that's, that's the end result. Yeah. Now, I think that that'll balance out. I think, I think so there too. are controls that we can, and, and I think controls on corporate democracy are going to be right. one of the things that flow from this. Well, th we've come to the end. Sure. Thanks, Richard. Thank you. And uh, hopefully you'll come back and we'll talk some more about the things that are going. Thanks Anytime. very much. Nice to If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.